The Vatican's new doctrinal chief sends a message to bishops critical of Pope Francis's agenda and is an outspoken American bishop about to be removed from his post. Father Gerald Murray is here with analysis. Former U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo takes us down the path of the patriarchs in Israel for his new film, Route 60, The Biblical Highway. And I've got a big announcement later in the show. The World Over begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a X post. I'm at Raymond Arroyo on X. Let's begin. Cardinal designate and new head of the Vatican's doctrinal office, Archbishop Victor Manuel Fernandez, gave an exclusive interview to the National Catholic Register's Ed Penton earlier this week. In it, he issues a stern warning to bishops. Joining me now with analysis of this story and much more, a member of the papal posse, canon lawyer, and priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray. Thank you for being here. Uh, in Ed Penton's exclusive interview with Cardinal Designate Fernandez, um, he, he seems to warn bishops, Fernandez does, against appearing to contradict what he calls, quote, the doctrine of the Holy Father. When Penton asked what the cardinal designate meant by that, he had this to say. I'll put it on the screen. When we speak of obedience to the magisterium, this is understood in at least two senses. One is the more static sense of a deposit of faith, which we must guard and preserve unscathed. But on the other hand, there is a particular charism for this safeguarding, a unique charism, which the Lord has given only to Peter and his successors. In this case, we're not talking about a deposit, but about a living and active gift, which is at work in the person of the Holy Father. I do not have this charism, nor do you, nor does Cardinal Burke. Today, only Pope Francis has it, end quote. Father Jerry, uh, your thoughts on this idea of protecting the doctrine of the Holy Father, a living, active gift? Well, I would disagree with the Cardinal Designate first on his categorization as of the deposit of faith as being static. Uh, static means basically not moving, not living, just something on a shelf. That's not true. The doctrine of the faith, the living word of God as expressed in the dogmas of the faith, they're very much alive because they guide the life of the church. Now, as regards the living uh, experience he speaks about, this reminds me of people who talk about the Constitution as a living document, which basically right. means we're going to rewrite it according to what we think is important. Um, mm -hmm. All the bishops in the church enjoy the office of successor of the apostles. The, now, the Pope is the successor of Peter, who's the head of the church, but the other bishops have a responsibility to teach orthodox doctrine in their diocese. And then, according to Vatican II, they all share a concern for the universal church. So the idea that mm -hmm. uh, no bishop can speak about what orthodox doctrine is until the pope tells him what it is, no. The pope and the bishops are both subject to the word of the Lord, and that word as expressed in dogma is clear. Now changes mm -hmm. under the guise of saying, well, it's a living magisterium, wait a minute. Those have to be judged on whether they're in complete harmony with what's been revealed. Mm. Father, Archbishop Fernandez also addressed the fear that has been expressed by some that the synod seeks to, quote, change doctrine. He said this, the doctrine does not change. The gospel will always be the same. Revelation is already settled, but there is no doubt that the church will always be tiny in the midst of such an immensity of truth and beauty and will always need to continue to grow in her understanding. Uh, Father Jerry, he says doctrine is settled, but there's always this but. Uh, what's meant by the second part of that? That, uh, you know, the church will always need to continue to grow in her understanding, like she doesn't get the message yet. Yes, well, understanding can grow because the more we reflect on a reality, the deeper we can appreciate its meaning. But that's not, I think, the sense of growth he's talking about. Uh, he's used the expression before incomplete uh, and that it's not, you know, something in the doctrine that is not fulfilling 
uh, the mission of, of a complete and sufficient knowledge of a truth, uh, well, we would deny this. The Catholic Church teaches that the defined dogmas of the faith uh, are easily understood and that their sense and meaning remains the same over time. So the idea, mm. and I think we're going to hear this at the Synod, particularly regarding sexual morality, the Church has a limited and incomplete understanding of human sexuality. And modern times have given us a broader view, and we have to respond to that, to which I would say nonsense. Mm. Modern times have shown the truth and value of the Catholic teaching about sexual morality. Mm. If anything, the chaos we're yeah. experiencing is a condemnation of infidelity. Yeah, and, and I think there's kind of a confusion between prudential judgments of the Holy Father, which anybody can disagree with or agree with, and stating doctrine, the Holy Father stating the doctrine and defending the doctrine. Those are two different things that I think uh, it, it seem to be conflated these days. Father, we'll unpack much more of this interview next week with Robert Royal when we have the full posse together. Um, I want to get your take on another huge story. It was widely reported last week that the papal nuncio to the United States, Archbishop Christophe Pierre, traveled to Rome to meet with Pope Francis about alleged dissent from the papal agenda here in the U.S. Reports suggest that outspoken Bishop of Tyler, Texas, Bishop Joseph Strickland, was a focal point of the discussion. According to public Vatican records, Pope Francis met with the nuncio and the prefect of the dicastery for bishops. But the pillar reports that the group touched on the possibility of asking for Bishop Strickland's resignation following a visitation of his diocese, a Vatican inquiry there, which happened earlier a few months ago. Uh, Bishop Strickland has run afoul of the nuncio and the Vatican in the past for supporting priests who declined to be vaccinated. Uh, he once tweeted that Pope Francis was, quote, undermining the deposit of faith. Father, your thoughts? Yes, well, Raymond, I think this is really regrettable, what's happening right now regarding Bishop Strickland, because he is obviously a champion of orthodoxy. He's outspoken and courageous. You know, he was the bishop who protested the horrible homosexual group that was being honored by the uh, Los Angeles Dodgers, the so-called Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, who mock religious life and Catholic doctrine. Well, he was out there praying. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you send uh, a, an apostolic team to visit, the message is basically you're doing something wrong. I don't know what they found. We haven't heard about the report, but uh, there, are, there have been no previous media reports that he's running a bad diocese or has done something wrong there. Uh, I think he's in the, yeah. you know, let's say, uh, he's, he's in center stage precisely because he takes such a strong view. And this reminds me of the bishop in Puerto Rico, Bishop Fernandez. You know, he was right. Removed. And I think that was unjust because he did nothing wrong. If you commit a canonical crime... Uh, or if you're mentally or physically incapable of running a diocese, yes, you should right. uh, be removed, but not if you're just preaching orthodoxy and doing it yeah. courageously. And, and Father Jerry, you mentioned uh, Bishop Fernandez. That was a Puerto Rican bishop who all he did, by the way, was defend the traditional Latin mass. Um, he uh, believed in religious exemptions from the COVID vaccine, all of which he was correct on, we might add here. Uh, it also puts me in mind of Bishop Holly. Both of those men were asked to resign and refused. Now it appears Bishop Strickland has said he would not uh, resign. But we've seen this before, Father, where these men are just summarily dismissed with no canonical process. Is that what we're about to see here? Well, we might see that. And I have to say, as a matter of organizational and canonical policy, to ask someone to resign an office uh, is really asking them to sign their own death warrant, so to speak. And I don't mm. think that's mm. right. If the man's committed a canonical crime, remove him. Uh, if it's a question of being delicate because perhaps he's got some, you know, emotional instability or he's physically unable to carry on, fine. You know, you could say, we'll, we'll grant you your, uh, your request for resignation. But in this case, it seems he's perfectly fine. He's doing a good job in his diocese, he stirs up the hackles of people who disagree with him. But that's no reason to fire a bishop. And, or even to ask him to resign. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. He, it, by the way, it's not disobedient to the Pope to say, no, I don't want to resign. Because remember, uh, the office mm -hmm. that he received uh, is to service uh, as a successor of the apostles. And uh, the Pope mm -hmm. with the bishops, you know, they formed the Episcopal College. There should be ultimate respect for bishops who are, have committed no canonical crimes.
Yeah, well, Strickland says, look, he has a mandate from Benedict the 16th, and he's going to continue that. And it appears he has some support in Washington, D.C. In addition to the Strickland situation, the bishops of Southern California, including Archbishop Gomez of Los Angeles and Bishop Kevin Van of Orange, were also visited by the nuncio. Now, they were questioned, apparently, for their noncompliance with Traditiones Custodes, which is Pope Francis's restrictions on the celebration of the traditional Latin Mass in their dioceses. The result of those visits, according to a piece in Crisis magazine, is that the traditional Masses in the Archdiocese of L.A. and the Diocese of Orange are to be suppressed. Again, in an age of faithlessness, what is this seeming pathological fear of the traditional Latin Mass? What is going on here? Well, what's going on here is a contradiction of what Pope Francis himself said uh, when he was in Lisbon for World Youth Day, where he said, everyone, he said, this is an important word in the church. The church is for everyone, everyone, everyone. He repeated that. Uh, he also brought that up when he met with his Jesuit brethren there in Lisbon. Now we're being told everyone doesn't include people who want to go to the Latin Mass because they're being banished from their church. It, it's ridiculous that you would have a group of people removed to a basement or a gymnasium for the celebration of the holy sacrifice of the mass on a portable altar when you have beautiful churches and altars for this. Now what lies behind it, your question is good. There is an hostility uh, that has been expressed, sad to say, by Pope Francis and the people who work with him in the, in the Vatican, and they basically think that the Latin mass is something that needs to be suppressed. And here's a perfect mm -hmm. example. There's nothing uncatholic in telling the Pope and his associates, you made a mistake here. The Latin Mass doesn't need to be uh, abolished or restricted because it's a good and holy thing. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if the fraternity of St. Peter priests can, can, and thank God they can celebrate this Mass, why can't the rest of us? Why is this, you know, well, basically discrimination against diocesan priests who want to say the Mass? Yeah, well, you know why, because it's now been characterized as somehow an ideological practice or a political practice or something of division, which it is not. And, Father, that's why, look, we have uh, consistently for years tried to push back against this absurd narrative that I don't know where it's coming from. Well, we do know who's propagating it. Uh, Father Spadaro, who was just raised, uh, he's now head of a dicastery, a secretary of a dicastery this week. But... Uh, the, related to all this is this ongoing condemnation of anyone who questions what's happening, which is a radical transformation of the church, a shaking of the church, so-called conservative critics of the pope. Uh, last week, the Washington Post named a number of people. Now, Father, apparently you've made this enemies list. Uh, the National Catholic Reporter, a columnist there, took issue with so-called conservative critics of the synod including you, for daring to ask questions about the synod on synodality. The knives seem to be out. Why are progressives so afraid of dialogue, the dialogue that Pope Francis is calling everybody to? Yeah. Well, I just remind them, Pope Francis, from the beginning of the pontificate, said he wants uh, frankness. He wants gospel frankness. At the first synod, he told the bishops, you know, people have told me in the past, don't speak out at a synod because the Pope might not like to hear what you have to say. And Pope Francis said, none of that is true. We want people to speak out. Now, what happens when we speak out, I'll be blunt, we make convincing arguments to show that many of the innovations that are being proposed right now are wrong. I'll give a perfect example. The Archbishop of Berlin, mm -hmm. Heiner Koch, just authorized priests in his diocese to bless homosexual unions. So people who get married, two men who get married at City Hall and then come to the church to be blessed, the Archbishop of Berlin said, this is great, go ahead and do it. This man is encouraging a blasphemous ritual, blessing mortal sin, because sodomy remains a sin. It hasn't changed. Now, he does this, and then people who tell him this isn't in accord with the Bible and with teaching of the church, somehow we're wrong because we're not in the gospel spirit? No. The Archbishop of Berlin should either repent or resign because he's not following Christ. Are we a church centered on Jesus Christ or on whoever happens to be in power? The fact that he's the Archbishop of Berlin should make him tremble. He has to answer for all of the people in his diocese. And now he's telling some of them, go ahead and commit mortal sin. And priests, go ahead and pretend God's going to favor it with your blessing. This is an outrage. 
Getting upset about this is a sign of health in the life of the church. Father Jerry, we will leave it there until next week. The entire posse will be coming together. And of course, we are going to analyze the uh, pregame show, if you will, for the Synod. Father Jerry Murray, thank you for being here. I've got an exciting new project that I've been working on for some time, and it's really a response to something so many of you have requested for so long. Here's a quick trailer for my brand new Christmas album, Raymond Arroyo, Christmas, Merry and Bright. wanted to remind people of the merry and the bright. La, 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 la. It's such a special project. I'll tell you much more about it in the next week, but it features traditional Christmas carols, some beloved favorites re-energized with a big band, some so tender, some really peppy. You can pre-order it now from Barnes & Noble, Amazon, EWTN's catalog, Apple Music, Spotify, wherever you get your music. It hits stores September 22nd. It makes the perfect Christmas gift. And I'll be doing a Christmas concert tour in select cities. Join me on the road throughout the Christmas season. Visit RaymondArroyoChristmas.com for more information. RaymondArroyoChristmas.com. Cutting through the heart of the promised land in Israel is a road often referred to as the path of the patriarchs. This 146-mile stretch of highway is known officially as Route 60. It is of deep historical and biblical significance to both Christians and Jews. My next guest is one of the stars of this new documentary about the fabled road. It's called Route 60, The Biblical Highway. Here to tell us about it and much more is the former U.S. Secretary of State, now distinguished fellow at the Hudson Institute, Mike Pompeo. Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for joining us. Raymond, thanks for having me on. It's good to be with you again. Uh, wonderful to see you. Before we talk about this incredible new movie, uh, Route 60, I want to get your take on a few stories currently making headlines. It's been a little over a year since um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Just last week, your successor, uh, Anthony Blinken, announced yet another aid package to Ukraine. Watch. The United States is committed to empowering Ukraine to write its own future. In the crucible of President Putin's brutal and ongoing war, we're announcing new assistance totaling more than $1 billion in this common effort. That includes $665.5 million in new military and civilian security assistance. Uh, in total, we committed over $43 billion in, assist in security assistance since the beginning of the Russian aggression. Secretary Pompeo, uh, another billion in aid going to Ukraine. Um, so soon after the disastrous fires in Maui, a new CNN poll shows a majority of Americans, 55 percent, do not support additional aid going to Ukraine. Your thoughts on Blinken's announcement, and actually it's, it's 100 billion plus so far, and what about these poll numbers? Well, I, I think the poll numbers reflect the failures of the Biden administration, not what is, in my judgment, an incredibly important American mission. They just just messed this up, Raymond. Uh, our, our model in the Trump administration was, of course, to deter precisely what has happened here. Vladimir Putin didn't change. The only thing that changed was American leadership, right? We changed presidents and secretaries of state, and Vladimir Putin invaded Europe. And your point about another $665 million or billion dollars, what, what, whatever number was you said, the, the point is, wh whatever we were going to provide, we, we should have provided immediately. This could be over. We could not have, we could have stopped innocent civilians in Ukraine from being killed. We could have stopped authoritarian aggression in Europe. We could have prevented what is inevitable if Putin is successful, which is not just Ukraine, but Moldova, perhaps the Baltic nations also being invaded by Vladimir Putin. You know, the, the Biden administration has just fundamentally failed at the, the central mission, which is deter that kind of aggression. I, I wish they had not been so fearful of uh, of somehow 
uh, spinning Vladimir Putin up. My sense is he was already spun up. Provocation comes yeah. from weakness, not strength, and instead they've been weak. Mm. And speaking of Russia, North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un arrived in Russia on Tuesday for talks with Putin about a weapons deal with Russia in need of munitions after 18 months of war. Now, Russia's already acquired weaponized drones from Iran that it's used in Ukraine. State Department spokesman Mather Miller had this to say about the possible arms deal. We have been very clear about what our position is, um, which is that any transfer between um, uh, of arms from North Korea to Russia would violate multiple United Nations Security Council resolutions. And we will monitor what happens and, and won't be uh, will not hesitate to take action to hold those accountable if necessary. Secretary Pompeo, what do you make of these developments and how would or should the U.S. act if that transfer takes place from North Korea to Russia? First of all, Rim, that, that statement is laughable. You, you said earlier that the Iranians have transferred weapons to Russia. That's true. Drones that have killed Ukrainian civilians and kids. Uh, what has the administration done? They gave them $6 billion the day before yesterday. So rather than hold anyone accountable for violating these restrictions, these sanctions, they've rewarded them. Uh, they're trying to cut a deal with the Iranians even as we speak. If you're Chairman Kim in North Korea, and you saw that. I don't think for a moment a statement by the State Department spokesman means a darn thing to you. Well, they said, well, we'll hold them accountable. We, we They know our position. It's not about words, Raymond. It's about deeds. This is this is what we had done yeah. so well. Chairman Kim would not have done that mm -hmm. under a different set of leaders here in the United States. Mm hmm. And Secretary Pompeo, the, the gray eminence behind all of this really is China. And you see China ramping up tensions with Taiwan. Uh, this partnership with Russia only gets stronger by the day. This past July, Chinese and Russian warships conducted joint exercises in the Sea of Japan before engaging in joint patrols near U.S. waters in Alaska. President Biden, on his recent visit to Vietnam, said this of U.S. policy toward China. Really, what this trip was about, it was less about containing China. I, I, I don't want to contain China. I just want to make sure we have a relationship with China that is on the up and up, squared away. Everybody knows what it's all about. Secretary Pompeo, is not containing China a wise policy here, given what we've seen, the affirmation partnership, uh, aforementioned partnership in Russia, their human rights violation, et cetera? That language that President Biden used there from Hanoi was music to Xi Jinping's ears, the leader of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, forget containing China. You, we need to protect America. And J President Biden has just simply failed to do that. The Chinese have stolen billions of dollars of intellectual property. They foisted a virus that killed uh, nearly a million people here inside the United States. They've run spying operations inside of our country. They, they're in control of major research programs inside our institutions. They're buying farmland near our military facilities. And President Biden simply says, well, we want to have a relationship that's on the up and up. But he's done nothing to make that happen. And that relationship today is not on the up and up. The Chinese Communist Party has been at war economically with the United States for at least three decades. And President Biden has only encouraged Xi Jinping to continue this aggressive behavior. And it impacts people from California and Arizona to Maine and Vermont. It is really a bad set of policies. And the risk of war only escalates when President Biden says things like he said in Hanoi. Secretary Pompeo, does it does it amaze you that on the one hand, you have the Biden administration saying we need climate change pacts and we have to bind the world to to, uh, you know, serve the environment and protect the environment. And on the other hand, we are inducing American companies to do business with China, the world's greatest polluter, for, to say nothing of the religious and human rights violations in that country. Raymond, it's unexplainable. Uh, we, we know that over the last uh, handful of years, the United States has actually reduced its per capita carbon output, while the Chinese have just simply continued uh, to do what they do uh, and pollute uh, not only with carbon, but all of the other toxic particles as well. Now, it, it is silly for uh, President Biden to destroy the American economy while building the Chinese economy, even if one has as its top priority, if you had as your top priority what, what climate change or carbon reduction, uh, the set of policies mm -hmm. the Biden administration has put in place have done exactly the opposite.
Secretary Pompeo, a story we've been reporting for months is the Azerbaijani blockade of Nagorno-Karabakh. Now, despite claims that the border crossing is open, the ethnic Armenians in uh, Artsakh, they say they're still being denied humanitarian aid. There have been warnings of a genocide occurring in the region. Meanwhile, the United States and Armenia conducted joint military exercises in the region to train Armenian troops. Uh, Mr. Secretary, is a crisis being averted or is there still what amounts to a genocide being committed by Azerbaijan against ethnic Armenians, many of them Christians? Well, I remember this problem, Raymond, from my time as secretary. We tried to negotiate, broker a peace arrangement between the two of them, and we, we got a ceasefire mm -hmm. for a, a matter of days. I can't recall. Maybe it was weeks, but nothing that was material. You know, this conflict continues. Uh, I don't think the Biden administration is spending a minute on this. And, and Raymond, this is also, mm -hmm. we should note, this is all deeply connected to what you were just talking about. Think of the neighborhood there, Iran, Russia, and China, all around this place of Central Asia. Uh, the United States should remain committed to its central I ideals in the same way that we called out genocide against the Uyghurs inside of China. I hope this administration will continue to defend peoples of every faith, certainly Christians all around the world. Hmm. Secretary Pompeo, you were just here in Washington uh, earlier this week to premiere your new film, Route 60, The Biblical Highway. Uh, this movie is an unscripted travelogue produced by TBN. You, along with former ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, uh, traveled this historic highway, which runs from Nazareth to uh, Beersheba. Uh, it, and you discuss points of interest really common to Christians and Jews every step of the way. The film hits theaters for two nights, September 18th and 19th through Fathom events. How did you get involved in this project? And what about this stretch of road drew you in? Oh goodness! So uh, you can you can go find out what theaters it's in at Route 60. Movie, uh, and I, I say that because that's how I was drawn into this. Ambassador Friedman called me, and he knew that Judea and Samaria were was a place, and Israel was a place that was near and dear to my heart. Uh, as a Christian, one cannot help but understand Israel and Jerusalem Jerusalem's centrality to who we are. And so he proposed this. We would go to this historical place and walk to uh, Shiloh. We would walk to Jerusalem. We would walk to Bethlehem, um, Bethel. And we would go see these sites, these historical sites. And I would tell the, uh, the Bible stories there from the New Testament. He would tell them as an Orthodox Jew from the Old Testament perspective. And we would try to share with the whole world uh, some places that are historically important to Jews and Christians alike, show them things that, frankly, it's just very hard for people to get a chance to go see themselves. I hope folks will go out and watch the movie. It was deeply personal for me uh, as we changed policy in Judea and Samaria while I was Secretary of State. And I think for people of faith, uh, they will find it an encouraging movie as well. Before we continue, I want to give everybody a taste of what they'll see. This is a bit of Route 60, the biblical highway. Take a look. It can be said that for everything we wish to learn or want to become, there is a road to follow. From the beginning, the road to believing in only one true God, the maker of heaven and earth, has carved its roots through the ancient land of Israel. It is a road that Abraham, the father of nations, walked as the first believer in monotheism. It was along this road that God made his covenant with Abraham, promising that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. It is a road walked by Jesus, the central figure of Christianity. This road is deeply symbolic in the story of God shared by Jews and Christians. And it is a literal highway that bisects modern Israel, where it is now known simply as Route 60. Route 60 follows the ancient path from Nazareth to Beersheba. It connects many holy sites and biblical events in what could be called the original Bible Belt. It has mile markers, human and divine, to memorialize the acts of celebration, suffering, and salvation that are woven into Israel's history. 
I'm David Friedman, and I invite you to join me and my co-host and fellow traveler, Mike Pompeo, as we explore the ancient mysteries of Route 60, the biblical highway. Mr. Secretary, you are a committed Christian. Ambassador Friedman, as you mentioned earlier, is a devout Jew. How did both those experiences, those worldviews, develop the narrative of this documentary? So we each came at it from our own faith tradition, and then we came at it from a set of shared experiences in the Trump administration, where we had made the historic decision to move the embassy to Jerusalem. We had acknowledged that not every settlement is illegal. We'd acknowledged that Golan Heights belonged to Israel. So we had a we had a set of experiences that were overlapping. And then, of course, these are both Abrahamic faiths, and we had worked so hard to build out the Abraham Accords to create space for Israel, the rightful Jewish homeland. And so we obviously, our, our faiths have different uh, theological uh, endings, but they all share this same central story. And for us to each walk this road where Jesus had traveled so many years ago and tell our tell our understanding of how this applied to our faith uh, was really very special. We, we had a few laughs. Uh, we had a lot of fun, and I think everyone, including David and I, Ambassador Friedman and I, I think we all learned a lot as we walked along this historic route. No, it, it, it's fascinating. Look, I, I did my own documentary years ago in the Holy Land. I've been there many times. It really is off the beaten path, though, this documentary, of the usual sites in the Holy Land. Tell us a little about the itinerary. This was shot over four days, but many of these points of interest are usually off limits to tourists. Tell us about, for instance, uh, uh, the altar of Joshua. Yeah, so it's it's absolutely true. There were many places that I had not had the chance to go before, and it was um, because of the relationships we developed, we were able to go see them there. And they're in hard places where there is conflict today in in the West Bank, in Judea and Samaria. Uh, and so it was just great to go see them. So you talk about uh, the altar of Joshua. We got to go to Hebron. Very difficult for people to get to. Uh, and there you stood. An Orthodox Jew and an Evangelical Christian uh, between the at the tombs of the patriarchs between Abraham and Sarah, the founding patriarchs mm. of of each of our faiths. It was truly remarkable. You stood there and you you recognized that this is thousands of years of history, and that the stories that are told in this book, this the Bible, the stories that are told in this book are real and historically grounded. Yeah. And for people of faith to be there and to get a chance to see something that not a whole lot of Westerners will get a chance to see. I think it will be great for viewers. I know it was, for me, it was incredibly inspiring and reinforced my understanding of my own faith as well. It was the longest road. No, I, I've had that experience when you're there. It just, it, it makes it all come alive again. This 146 mile stretch of road connects these major cities that are all central to Christianity and Judaism. How did this journey, along with your travel companion, uh, enrich your faith? Did it did it change your faith? And were you surprised by anything you discovered there? Oh, goodness. You know, I think I, 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 you're always surprised. Your, your point about being in the Holy Land, you, you always see things and you, you unpeel the story and gain depth. That certainly happened on this experience as well. Um, these were roads less traveled, uh, places that um, I've not had the chance to be. Uh, but, you know, I, I will say this, Raymond, we also, and you'll see this in the movie, we interacted with lots of local citizenry, not only in Jerusalem, but in other places as well. And you saw that these were places inhabited by Christians and Jews and Arabs, Mus Arab Muslims, mm -hmm. Christian Arabs, uh, and you got a chance to interact with them. And they were so thrilled to see us there. We all see Judea and Samaria yeah. often on TV, and it's people throwing rockets and grenades and smoke. Um, we got a chance to see a different piece of its modern day history and to remind ourselves of why this place is so central uh, to both Jews and Christians. Yeah, it's quite a journey. Mr. Secretary, before I let you go, uh, I need your thoughts, and you alluded to it earlier with the Abrahamic Accords. Tell us the current state of Arab-Israeli relations in the Middle East. I mean, this week marks the third anniversary of those Abraham Accords, the bilateral agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. The accords were supposed to lessen the Muslim, Jewish, Arab, Israeli tension and spur greater economic cooperation. Um, in the last three years, what have you seen as a result of this treaty? And has it been allowed to reach its full potential? 
Raymond, you know, there's always more room uh, to, to grow, but there's no doubt that the things we hoped would happen have happened uh, in large measure. Uh, more economic connectivity between the two, uh, security relationships between them are deeper, uh, diplomatic relationships between them. You know, there's airplanes traveling now from Tel Aviv Jaffa Airport to uh, the United Arab Emirates and Sudan and Morocco, something that, you know, we kind of take for granted in the United States. You can hop on a plane and fly from Vegas to L.A. to New mm -hmm. York. That, that didn't happen for decades. Uh, and so the relationships uh, among not only peoples of different nations, but people of different faiths have absolutely deepened. Uh, it was a long time coming. Uh, it will take a lot more effort. I, I hope that other nations will join the Abraham Accords, and I hope every country all around the world, including all of the each of the Gulf Arab states, mm -hmm. will come to understand Israel's rightful place in the world. Before I, before I, I end, um, and and I mention the film one more time, were you stunned that the Saudis found common ground and are now working with the Iranian regime? Did that surprise you? Raymond, when uh, we are not, when the United States is not a reliable partner, when a president calls the leader of another country a pariah, it shouldn't surprise anyone that they try to, to find a solution to provide security for their own people. They try to take down tensions mm -hmm. with what are real threats. I think, I think the leadership in uh, the Gulf Arab states understands that the world's largest state sponsor of terror, the Iranian regime, uh, is not a friend. But when the United States isn't prepared uh, to be a good partner, to be a good ally, to to help you where you need help, it, it doesn't surprise me at all that other countries are finding China or Iran or North Korea as places, well, they've just got to take down the tension a little bit. It saddens me, um, but I, I know how nations mm -hmm. behave. They're always going to protect themselves, Raymond. And when we're not there to just be that partner, there's always risk they'll find others. Secretary Pompeo, thank you for your insight and the film Route 60, the biblical highway featuring Mike Pompeo, is in theaters September 18th and 19th only. Go to route60.movie for more information and tickets. Thank you, Secretary Pompeo. Raymond, thank you. Bless you. Have a good day. We are just weeks away from the release of my new Turnabout Tales book and historic picture book, The Magnificent Mischief of Tad Lincoln. It tells the little known story or forgotten story of President Lincoln's youngest son, who was not only a source of comfort and joy to his father at his darkest moments, but together they established a national holiday tradition we continue to this day. It's a story of mercy and forgiveness and the power of a child in a parent's life and in the life of a nation. It's the perfect holiday book, and it's available now for pre-order at the EWTN catalog, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or wherever books are sold. It goes on sale October 3rd, The Magnificent Mischief of Tad Lincoln. I think it'll be an important and fun part of your family library. With the Synod on Synodality set to begin in just a few months, Moral theology and traditional Catholic teaching on sexuality seem to be under daily assault, even from within the church. Where is the voice of reason upon which the faithful have been able to depend throughout church history? My next guest has been asking just that question. He's the professor of theology at Franciscan University of Steubenville and author of a recent column in Crisis Magazine entitled, Put an End to the Madness. Would you welcome Dr. Regis Martin? to the program. Professor Martin, thank you for being here. I want to begin with your recent op-ed in Crisis, where you write jokingly about placing a call to Pope Francis during his Wednesday audience, and you ask him to stop all the madness. Uh, in your telling, Francis does take the call. Uh, what point were you making by uh, beginning your op-ed that way? What were you attempting to do there? Well, you know, somebody said that uh, if you don't try to slay your audience, uh, your reader with your first sentence, uh, you might lose them. So I, I thought maybe I would begin with a spoof, uh, a send up, and it was really a caper. But uh, a lot of people misunderstood and thought that I had in fact contacted the Holy Father. And if they knew anything <laughs> about my computer skills, I, I don't even own a smartphone. I can barely dial my own number. But uh, I thought that would be a good point of entry uh, to sort of electrify the attention of uh, of my reader. 
Yeah. And you write about several problems you see under this pontificate, beginning with the deposit of faith, the depletion of which you say appears to have been programmatic and a programmatic theme of this pontificate from the start. Where do you most see a depletion of the deposit of faith? And why are more of the faithful and even bishops uh, not pushing back against it? Well, I, I think there is a, a twofold uh, crisis that we, we face. On the one hand, uh, a straight out crisis of faith. People don't know what to believe. Uh, there's really no sense of the faith. But then there's a crisis of courage. Uh, and I think this afflicts a great many of the bishops and cardinals. They certainly know what the deposit of faith is, but they don't seem able to summon the courage to defend it. Uh, and that I find pretty shocking and really rather unprecedented. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to go back maybe to the fourth century, the crisis of Arianism, to find the same sort of uh, systemic silence uh, in the face of, uh, of uh, a full-throated assault upon the basic uh, teachings of the church. Yeah. Uh, what, were, what were the two, if I could get you to focus on the two most egregious departures from traditional teaching and that deposit of faith that really alerted you or alarmed you early on? Were, were there sure, one or I, two that you just said, wait a minute, yeah, we, we shouldn't go down this path? No, no, a couple of uh, flashpoints. I, I think initially back in 2016 when he struck the deal with Islam and he conceded mm. that uh, there's a lot of pluralism uh, in the world and that uh, as regards religion, this was somehow God's will. Uh, this was his creative intention, part of divine providence, to permit a diversity of religious opinion, uh, which which strikes me as a direct frontal assault upon uh, the, the centrality of, of, of Christ. Uh, this downsizes uh, the presence of Christ. He's been relativized. He doesn't seem to be as indispensable as he once was. If we have other equally legitimate voices, and, and the other flashpoint, of course, was, was in the moral order, uh, that interview that the Pope submitted to, that Disney later picked up and turned into a, a documentary. A bunch of kids are firing questions at the Vicar of Christ, and of course, they're all about sex. And the Pope pretty much gives the game away by saying that the Church's catechesis on sex is still in diapers, which seemed to me really uh, insulting. I mean, the shade of Aquinas must be shaking uh, to think that uh, his moral theology was so infantile that we had to wait another thousand years uh, for the, the kids uh, in California to improve upon it. I, I found that very offensive. Yeah, no, I think, uh, Dr. Martin, you and I may be the only two people who actually sat through that spectacle. I mean, I, I forced myself to watch it one night, but I did so alone, so I didn't afflict the rest of the family. But it was, it's kind of shocking. I mean, you got a, a woman who does porn, you know, on the side. You got a, you know, a transgender kid who's kind of hassling the Pope about why don't you affirm me? It, it was a very strange um, and, and uh, uh, rather bizarre outing. And I don't know why anyone near the Pope would have allowed such a thing, you know. But anyway, the German synodal way has been slow rolling for years, offering things like uh, bishops approving the blessings of same-sex couples, uh, lay preaching during mass, the possibility of women being ordained, and a request that priestly celibacy be re-examined by the Vatican. Now, you point out that this pope has done virtually nothing to stop it. Why do you think not? I mean, he did issue, uh, or, or offices in the Vatican, rather, did issue uh, the rather targeted corrections along the way. Well, I mean, there are one of two possible explanations. Either there's a want of courage, so we need to put some moral starch into uh, his papal shirt, or he simply doesn't believe uh, anymore. And that, that I think, is, is really frightening. Uh, look, a basic right, which I think every Catholic has, and the violation of that right has been fairly routine in recent years, is the right to remain secure in the possession of one's faith. You ought to know on the strength of what I believe that I can summon the courage to confront my persecutors. 
and they come in all sizes and shapes. I mean, there was a time when the Roman Empire sought to exterminate Christianity. And then in the last century, the Third Reich was bent upon uh, the liquidation of faith. Or maybe it's the local CCD coordinator who flatters herself with the latest fashion in liberal theology. But whatever the source, Catholics, I think, are entitled as a matter of simple justice to remain secure, to have a serene sense of what it is, I believe, what is permissible Roman Catholic doctrine and what is beyond the pale. And when hotshot mm -hmm. theologians, swashbuckling moralists, uh, decide to blow up the faith, and the church's moral tradition, I would hope that the Pope would step into the breach and say, no, you can't do that. That's wrong. Let me unplug that machinery because it's running amok. And this Pope hasn't done that. Mm. And that to me is that that to me is is just inexplicable. Yeah. Well, why do you think he hasn't? Why do you think he's so tolerant of not only um, diverse viewpoints, to put it kindly, within the church, but even outside of the church, uh, attacks on the faith and questions of long settled uh, of antiquity are now suddenly up for grabs again. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I can't really look into the soul of, uh, of the Vicar of Christ, but I, I can tell you this, that early on he wanted to make a mess. And right now he's got a bloody mess and uh, somebody has to clean it up. And it doesn't look as if he's disposed to do so. One, one thing I do know is that you can have bad popes, and, and we can survive that because the, the devil and hell will not prevail against God's church. But what we mustn't do is sort of deify the papacy, divinize it as if everything he says is de fide. Sometimes what he says is it's off the wall, and cardinals and bishops should call him up on that. And their failure to do so, I think, invites a deep cynicism on the part of ordinary church-going Catholics. Hmm. In an interview last week, Bishop Georg Batzing, who is the president of the German Bishops' Conference, said he believes, quote, the vast majority of Catholics in Germany support the decisions of the synodal way, and he sees no danger of a schism as a result of the direction being taken by the church in Germany. He did acknowledge that concerns about the synodal way have grown, but said, quote, that is precisely why we need more synodality in the sense of a common search for what the spirit of God is telling us today and where it is leading. Polarizations are a great danger, not only in society, but also within the church, he said, especially when the relevant protagonists and groups no longer talk to each other. Dr. Martin, you've been a theologian for decades. What is synodality, and how did this become a destination unto itself, spiritually speaking? I, I think it's been a dead letter. Uh, I would never have uh, endorsed it or encouraged the spread of it. I think it's an invitation uh, to catastrophe, uh, to a kind of collapse of the church's sense mm -hmm. of herself stripping of everything distinctively Catholic. And we have to put a stop to it. It, it, it doesn't go anywhere except straight to hell. And uh, I, I think uh, no one wants to go there. In an interview last month with German media, Bishop Johann Bonny, the Bishop of Antwerp, Belgium, said that the Flemish bishop's decision to bless same-sex unions was, quote, not going against the pope. Bishop Bonny said that he inferred this from two conversations he had with Pope Francis himself. When asked if blessing same-sex unions gave him a conflict of conscience uh, as he was going against a 2021 Vatican ruling by the dicastery of the doctrine of the faith, which states that the church may not bless same-sex unions, he said, quote, no, because it is about the pope. Not every man in Rome is pope. From my conversations, I know what my relationship with Pope Francis looks like. We speak cum petro et sub petro, with and under Peter, but not the whole Vatican is cum petro et sub petro. The Vatican has different positions and developments, and there are theological faculties in Rome that also belong to the Vatican and the Catholic Church. Rome is not just a document or a cardinal. No, Rome is also unity in diversity. Now, Dr. Martin, the registers, Ed Penton asked uh, the Vatican spokesman, Matteo Bruni, 
if the Vatican would be responding to Bishop Bonnie's claims. So far, we have heard nothing. Now, your thoughts on this, and do you see this kind of blatant disregard for church teaching and Vatican authority continuing as this synod process progresses? Well, it, it does seem to me that if something is regarded as sacred, of inviolable, then you would expect people to rally round and defend it, to shore up the best possible arguments in defense of what is, after all, an abiding, fundamental, indispensable deposit of belief. And the silence uh, on that uh, invites, I think, a, a kind of cynical uh, uh, regard uh, for these people who have been charged with the maintenance of the faith. If they won't come forward and defend the faith, then maybe uh, they don't think it's defensible. Uh, and they should be honest and acknowledge it publicly and then become Protestants. Look, we could lose mm -hmm. all of Germany and much of Northern Europe. We, we the, you know, the popes before have taken that risk when they told Henry, you can't divorce your wife and remarry. That's adultery. And we're prepared to go. We're prepared to allow the whole of Europe to be fractured because the defense of marriage is worth it. I, I think we may have to summon that kind of courage in the 21st century and tell the Germans, look, you're you're, you've gone too far. Uh, we're pulling the plug on this. You're welcome to become Protestants, but you can't maintain a Catholic uh, identity anymore. It's dishonest. Mm. Oh. During his Wednesday audience on May 24th, Pope Francis marked the World Day of Prayer for the Church in China. Now, this was a day instituted by Pope Benedict in 2007 to be held annually on the Feast of Mary, Help of Christians. Pope Francis had this to say to the people of China and the world. And he's saying here, I wish to assure my thoughts and closeness to our brothers and sisters in China and share in their joys and hopes. I offer a special thought to all those who suffer, pastors and the faithful, so that in the communion and solidarity of the universal church, they may experience consolation and encouragement. Dr. Martin, your thoughts, I mean, the suffering of Catholics in China has been, um, that, that they've seen, really is at the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. This pontificate has entered into that China-Vatican deal with this regime and renewed it twice. Uh, they've been loath to criticize the Chinese uh, government. And while it's wonderful to hear the Holy Father invoke the Chinese church, which he's done for the last three weeks, is this enough? No, it's obviously not enough. I mean, it's, uh, no, it, it isn't. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of sick making, really. On the one hand, you extend uh, consolation to these people who are suffering, but in large part because of your policies and your failure to rebuke mm -hmm. those who are subjugating them. Th th this, to me, is, is a double standard. It's sheer humbuggery. If you really cared about the Chinese people who are, you know, languishing beneath the boot of, of a communist regime, then at least have the kidney to say to the, the leadership in, in Beijing, look, this is wrong. You've got to stop doing it. You need to treat people humanely and allow them to practice their faith in an in a completely unfettered way. You can't manage uh, the interior life. And that's what they're doing. And the Pope ought to be able to say that. It's not mm -hmm. a matter of diplomacy. Yeah. It's a matter of speaking the truth to power. This week on Pentecost Monday, over 20,000 Catholic pilgrims filled the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Chartres in France after walking three days from Paris to pray that full freedom to celebrate the traditional Latin Mass could be possible. More than half of the people making the pilgrimage are young Catholics under 20 years old. Pope Francis began the restrictions on the traditional Latin Mass with that motu proprio, Guardians of Tradition, back in 2021. Uh, and they've seen restrictions on the TLM since then. What do you see as the message here? And how do you think Rome is accepting this? I mean, this is a youthful, organic demonstration of love for the liturgy, which one rarely sees ever. You know, there's a, a great line uh, from the poet W.H. Auden, who says uh, legislation is helpless against the wild prayer of longing. 
And you can see in these young French Catholics a longing for God, a desire for God, a hunger for transcendence, which is given a particular liturgical expression, and the Pope wants to stamp that out. That strikes me as really hideous. Uh, and why he would want to do that when here is a fresh, vibrant outpouring of faith on the part of young people mm. who witness to that faith at huge cost to themselves. I, it, it would seem to me that you would want to affirm and promote that, encourage it. This is a genuine sign. These are signs of the times, which I think the Pope ought to mm -hmm. seize upon uh, and promote. The fact that he doesn't that he's determined to somehow suppress it uh, seems to me completely, completely bizarre. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm always stunned that, you know, for people who are listening and seeking the movement of the Holy Spirit, when it comes to you in technicolor with thousands of young people waving banners and in, in silent prayer and chanting the tradition of the eternal, you know, language of the church, everybody covers their ears and closes their eyes. So no accompaniment for them. It does strike me as bizarre, too, and inexplicable. I mean, it's like cutting the youthful limbs off of a tree. It, it makes no sense to me, and a dying tree at that. What needs to be done, in your estimation, Dr. Martin, to restore the deposit of faith and mend the fractures that you see in the church today? Well, I think it's it's at bottom a Christological crisis. I mean, who is Christ uh, for me? Is he the centerpiece of my faith? Is he the heart of 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 the of the world? Uh, is he Alpha and Omega? And if he is, then he ought to be everywhere, and he ought to be enshrined in every place. You can't relativize him. You can't marginalize him. You can't negotiate uh, with the enemies of Christ and say, well, look, we'll compromise here and maybe there and, and not mention him quite so often. If, if you remove Christ, then you don't have a church. Uh, you eviscerate it. Uh, you, right at the heart of the church is Christ. And I would say, return to Christ, restore the primacy of Christ, and let his vicar uh, sing out his praises uh, in season and out. Hmm. We will leave it there. Thank you so much uh, for the time. And you can read Put an End to the Madness by Dr. Regis Martin uh, on Crisis Magazine's website. That's crisismagazine.com. Thanks again. Before we go, some very sad news. Uh, Washington attorney, former USCCB National Review board member and a guest of this show, Bob Bennett, passed away at the age of 84. Mr. Bennett had been for many years one of the most in-demand defense attorneys, known for his uncanny abilities to get corporations and executives and politicians on both sides of the aisle out of seemingly impossible legal jams. His clients included former President Bill Clinton, former Secretary of Defense Cap Weinberger, and the late Senator John McCain. In 2003, Bennett was asked to be a member of the U.S. Catholic Bishops National Review Board, its first incarnation when the church's sex abuse scandal first broke. In his most recent appearance on the show in 2018, he had this to say. Going to Rome was a very unique experience. Uh, Ann Burke, who's a, uh, a appellate court judge, Supreme Court mm -hmm. judge in, in Chicago, and Bill Burley, who is mm -hmm. a very noted Catholic layman and right. uh, Head of new, newspaper Chris man. Howard. Yeah, uh, the three of us went to to Rome, and uh, we met with then Cardinal Ratzinger, who. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was a year later or eight months later, yeah, became, became Pope, Pope Benedict. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very clear that he was interested. And we had a two-hour meeting with him, two hours. Hmm. And he took notes. Hmm. His, 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 he had trouble with English, mm -hmm. but he took notes. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, he read the notes back and had... I had the ability or talent to write notes like he did. I would have done much better in law school. He <laughs> Bob Bennett is survived by his wife, Ellen, to whom he was married for 54 years, his three daughters, as well as his brother, former Secretary of Education, Bill Bennett. May Robert Stephen Bennett rest in peace. That is all the time we have for now. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. 
On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Bye now. Thank you.